The national championship for college football has a very weird history to it. Today, it is expected to have a final game at the end of the season to determine a champion between the two best teams in the nation. We all have our opinions on who the best teams really are, as the playoffs have been rather exclusive with only four teams being selected to have a chance to play in the title game. With the playoffs expanding to 12 teams in 2024, this may silence the critics of the future, but it will not silence those of the past seasons. Prior to 2014, only two teams were selected by the BCS system to play in a national championship game. But years before that, only polls from news organizations would determine the champions without requiring a title game to ever be played. The idea of a separate championship game being needed for the national championship at all, when you compare it to the combined history of college football, still a very new idea. In the past, there were instances where games between a consensus number one and number two in the nation were played. They just happened by pure dumb luck. A system that would force the top ranked teams in the nation to play just did not exist due to various factors including conference tie-ins to certain bowls, rules preventing repeat appearances, and earliest fuck scheduling among other factors. These de facto title games were so rare that from 1936 to 1988 it happened only five times. Also, since most years the polls couldn't agree on who was one and who was two, multiple games could have been seen as potential de facto national title games. Finally, at the end of the 80s, fans were so tired of seeing so many split championships with no final resolution that college football began trying to find a way to end the problem of split national championships. To this day, the quest to crown a standalone national champion continues to be an evolving process. So what's the point of my painfully brief summary of the history of the national championship? Well. What I have done is I've reviewed every championship game that officially played since 1992, so I can give you my two cents on each era, each game, and the sport I love as a whole by proxy. While these systems also play a hand in the marquee games of the bowl calendar, I'm mainly going to focus on the games that directly affected the national championship. What this also means is I'm going to leave out all the de facto championship games before 1992. Do not boo me, you see the length of this fucker already. Not to mention, some of those games have so much backstory and lore baked into them that including them here would have made this the length of a feature length movie here. So without further delay, let's grind the axe on college football's national championship game. The following is a special presentation of ABC Sports. The Bull Coalition was the first attempt to have the top two teams in the country play each other, and it was, to put it bluntly, a fucking mess. What they tried to do was a proto New Year's Six with the Cotton, Orange, Sugar, and Fiesta Bowls all labeled as the Tier 1 games, while the Gator and Citrus were left to be the Tier 2. The top conference champions would play in the Tier 1 Bowls as the hosts, while lower division champions and runner-ups would fill out the remaining slots as at-large bids. It was a decent idea, but already you could tell it had holes in it everywhere. First problem, conference tie-ins would be the biggest issue as the traditional bowls for the SEC, the Big 8, and the Southwest Conference, namely the Sugar, the Cotton, and the Orange Bowls, all wanted to retain their traditional bowl ties. Because of this, the conference champions for those conferences had to show up for their traditional bowl games no matter what. For example, if the champion of the Southwest Conference and the SEC were number one and number two in the nation, they would not be able to play against each other as they would be forced to be the host team for their traditional bowl games. The other conferences that were involved here were the ACC, the Big East, the Pac-10, but for their runner-up only, and Notre Dame because it's fucking Notre Dame and they're God's favorite pain in the ass. Second problem, the polls were not working together to be a unified force on who was number one and number two in the country, so the odds were very high that even if there was a one versus two bowl game according to the AP, it could be considered a 1v3 or 2v3 or 4v5 or whatever the fuck you want to call it to the coaches poll. They did create an in-house bowl poll to try to resolve these issues, but as you will see, it didn't solve shit. 
third, the mid-majors were firmly told to hit the bricks. The if you were in the WAC, the Big West, or the MAC, that was too fucking bad. This was despite less than a decade earlier, BYU became the last mid-major to win the national championship. The excuse, of course, was the strength of schedule was not as high caliber as the major conferences, and it would not be worth it to include them with all the big boys. Which is actually pretty funny because fourth and fucking finally, the Big Ten and Pac-10 champions were not involved in the coalition. Yes, the Pac-10 would send a runner-up to fill out the at-large bids, but the Big Ten had no part of it. And this is mainly due to the fucking Rose Bowl telling the coalition to pound salt. They had a lucrative TV contract with ABC, and they were not about to get shit canned by potentially lackluster at-large teams or, God forbid, lose their New Year's Day time slot. As you will see, the Rose Bowl's thorns will be a prominent pain in the ass as this goes on. So, that's about as simple as I can make this shit on what the Bowl Coalition was. Now, on to the actual games. When a college football season begins, everybody hopes to be a national champion. season only a handful still have a chance new year's day 93 the real number may be just two the Superdome in New Orleans, another one of those moments in sport that could grow into legends. A real live chance to produce a college football champion without a vote. Despite the glaring issues stated earlier, the coalition area began on the right foot with consensus number one, Miami, the defending national champions, facing off against consensus number two, Alabama, in the Sugar Bowl. A generational matchup as the team of the 80s faced off against the team of the 70s. Coming into the game, Miami had won 29 in a row and were led by Heisman quarterback Gino Toretta, who was near perfect all season, only throwing four interceptions. Early on, though, it was a defensive slugfest, with both teams throwing interceptions that would only lead to field goals, with Alabama leading 6-3. Then, in the second quarter, the field goal stalemate was broken with an Alabama touchdown by running back Sherman Williams. A bad interception by Toretta in the third quarter would lead to another Alabama touchdown, this time by running back Derek Lassick. A pick six from Alabama's linebacker George Teague would almost put the game out of reach. Miami, though, would have a punt return for a touchdown, and then they would have a chance to finally get moving on offense. Gino Toretta connected deep with wide receiver Lamar Thomas on what could have been an 89-yard touchdown, but then the strip happened, and the offense just couldn't get going the rest of the game. Alabama straight up dominated the Hurricanes despite being heavy underdogs. Thanks to a lack of discipline by Miami, resulting in multiple costly penalties and an embarrassing performance by Toretta with three interceptions, Alabama would be crowned a consensus national champion by the polls, and Junction boy Gene Stallings would bring home Alabama's first title since the Bear Bryant years. Afterwards, we were not going to see Alabama for a little bit. Due to NCAA violations after the 92 season, Stallings would be out by 95, and Alabama would tumble into mediocrity for the next 15 years. Wow. Imagine a world without Alabama being a fucking evil empire. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Now a new day, a new year, another golden chance. Two coaching legends connected in so many ways. Tonight, one will be separate. One will be national champion. What the f*** was that? 
This is when things began to come apart for the coalition. While Nebraska had run the table to earn number one in the coaches' polls, AP had them at number two. West Virginia was 11-0, and Florida State stood at 10-1, and there was no agreement on who was second and who was third. Despite having lost to Notre Dame earlier in the season, Florida State was considered number one in the AP and number three in the coaches. Why did the AP have such a hard-on for the Seminoles? Oh, nothing really. Just Heisman quarterback Charlie Ward. Meanwhile, West Virginia was number two in the AP and number three in the coaches. Nebraska was selected for the Orange Bowl, and regardless of whoever they played, it would be for the national title being undefeated and being top two in the polls. Choice on paper would have been to go with West Virginia, who was also undefeated, but the Orange Bowl committee selected Florida State, overlooking the loss to Notre Dame, citing West Virginia playing down to weaker teams and too many close victories, and also their in-house bowl poll gave Florida State a slight advantage in their own rankings. Little bullshit if you ask me, but we'll run with it. Due to this, if West Virginia just takes care of business in the Sugar Bowl, they could potentially win a split championship with the winner of the Orange Bowl, quickly defeating the entire purpose of this fucking shit show. We will quickly check on the Mountaineers later on after we discuss this Orange Bowl, but going into the game, they were considered favorites over Florida. Nebraska, despite being undefeated, was 17-point underdogs coming into this game. Early in the first quarter, a punt return touchdown by Nebraska was nullified because of a penalty, even though there wasn't a clear and obvious foul. Midway through the second, uh, this... Earlier in this year, Frazier turns it into a... deflection to Reggie Ball! Touchdown, Nebraska! Happened shocking everybody in the stadium, which was overwhelmingly pro Florida State, and gave Nebraska a 7-3 lead. Early in the third, Florida State would finally get the offense rolling with a deep pass by Charlie Ward getting into the red zone. Down at the goal line, a one-yard rushing touchdown gave them a 12-7 lead. Yeah, 12-7. They went for two and fucking missed. Wait, did he fumble that ball? Come on, throw the flag, throw the challenge flag. Uh, oh, it's 1994. Instant replay hasn't been a thing yet, so... Uh, had this been able to be reviewed, it's likely a turnover and a touchback for Nebraska, but instead it's a touchdown. That's not going to haunt them at all, right? This Nebraska defense played out of its goddamn mind all night, holding Florida State's offense in check most of it. However, it still came down to the wire. After another Florida State field goal, Nebraska was able to find the end zone again off of a touchdown from Lawrence Phillips to cut the score to 15-13. After a defensive stop by the Huskers, Nebraska was able to drive down the field and take the lead off of a field goal, making it 16-15 for Nebraska. But then they fucked up and kicked the ball out of bounds, giving Charlie Ward the extra yards needed to get the ball into field goal range where, with 24 seconds to go, mind you, Florida State would kick it to take the lead 18-16, which made the Florida State bench go absolutely bonkers, so much so, the refs threw a flag for unsportsmanlike conduct and backed up the damn kickoff. How the fuck do you let that happen, Bobby Bowden? Even with the extra yards, Tommy Frazier was facing a tough challenge with under a minute to go in the game to get Nebraska into field goal range, but oh my God, did he. They should have a second left here. He was clearly down before the final zero went up. After a premature celebration by the Seminoles, the ref made the right call. Nebraska has a chance to shock the world and win the national title. <laughs> God damn it. What is it with wide field goals involving Florida State in some you blew it. <laughs> Oh god, what a fucking shake. Oh, that never gets old. Florida State is a lock for at least a share of the national championship, but would West Virginia get... Oh yeah, 
I forgot. Mountaineers can't have nice things. The 95 Orange Bowl was definitely one of the more intense games I witnessed when I was doing this review, and it's hardly surprising when Miami's defense has Ray Lewis and Warren Sapp on it. It was so bad for Nebraska's offense, Tom Osborne ended up benching Tommy Frazier at quarterback in favor of Brooke Behringer. Yeah, I don't know who the fuck he is either. He ends up making him look like a genius, driving the ball down the field for a 19-yard touchdown pass to Mark Gilman to make it close. However, Miami has no such uncertainties as Frank Costa throws a 35-yard dart to wide receiver Jonathan Harris to take a 17-7 lead at the start of the second half. This is when shit hit the fan for Miami. Two minutes later, after Nebraska three and out, the worst error that you can do in this situation occurred pinned deep in their own territory. Costa gets sacked in the end zone for a safety. The score is now 17-9. Nebraska could tie it with a touchdown and a two-pointer. However, with Nebraska knocking on the door early in the fourth, Behringer throws the ball for the corner, and it is miraculously picked off by Miami. Miami has them on the ropes, but the defense is starting to bend. Not to mention miscues on special teams and the offense being stonewalled have forced them to be on the field for a very long time. With seven minutes to go and Tommy Frazier back in the game, fullback Corey Schlesinger runs the ball in for a Husker touchdown. The ensuing two-point try is good. We are now tied at 17. Miami's defense is being called upon too much to save a struggling offense. The offense, however, has one chance to put the dagger in. Just got it off. Costa deep, wide open, right there. Uh, really? Dude. You had the motherfucker deep and wide open on busting coverage and you overthrow him? What the fuck, man? Nebraska has been saved from oblivion with this error. Miami's defense continues to crack from fatigue. Frazier is starting to carve them up like a Christmas ham and calls upon his fullback to put an end to Miami's dreams. Already in field goal range. Give credit where credit is due here. Nebraska had a really shitty first half, but they hung in there, were stubborn, and they were able to outplay and outcondition Miami in the second half to get the win here. At last, Tom Osborne has finally got his long sought after national championship. And he will be back for more, just not in the coalition. First, if it wasn't already extremely obvious, this was another game between number one and number three in the country. At least it was consensus this time. Who was number two then? Well, it was Penn State, who had already joined the Big Ten and already won the conference championship. As mentioned earlier, the Rose Bowl told the Bowl Coalition to shove it. Penn State was undefeated and would go on to win the Rose Bowl the following day after this game, meaning we had two undefeated teams from the major conferences who could be considered national champions. What? Not split. Nebraska will win the full share? What the fuck? That's incredibly shocking. I guess the way that they had a gritty win against Miami, who was 10-1 and and number three going into their game, I guess it was a stronger win in the eyes of the polls, but that's still shocking. Despite this, the critics were getting loud as fucking hell at this point after two straight one versus three national title games. Something needs to be done, but college football doesn't change when the fans cry foul. It only changes when the bottom line is affected. No, the true reason that the coalition folded was actually the Southwest Conference's fault. After SMU's death penalty in the 1980s and Arkansas fucking off for the SEC, a large chunk of their membership announced they were merging with the Big 8 to form the Big 12. The conference would fold operations at the end of the 1995 seasons and the teams remaining in the conference scattered into mid-major hell. This was a major conference for the coalition and for college football as a whole. 
and this was a massive fucking problem. Adding to this cascade of bullshit, God's golden hemorrhoid, Notre Dame had fallen into mediocrity, barely making bowl eligibility after going 6-4-1 that season. The Irish were still placed in the Fiesta Bowl, where the Colorado Buffaloes tore them down like the walls of Jericho. It was abundantly clear the coalition failed miserably to produce an undisputed national champion and also create secondary bowls that didn't suck. So now what? <laughs> Welcome to the Ball Lions, baby. We've learned from our lessons from the last three years, and we will implement them with a fair hand. Conference tie-ins? Fuck that. It causes us more headaches than we know how to manage. Throw it out the window. Southwest Conference dissolves, so there's no fucking point in two teams with automatic tie-ins. We will just add another at-large bid to replace them and keep everything the same. We even have both the Pac-10 and the Big Ten involved now. No, not their conference champions. The Rose Bowl threatened our families with cement shoes and a fishing trip if we approached them. But we got runner-ups. They're pretty good too, right? You know who isn't good? The mid-majors. A couple of conferences approached us asking to join, so we called the cops and reported them for trespassing. Only the major leagues can win national titles. What, you expected more changes? Fuck that, it was perfect the way it was. We got consensus champions each of the last three years after all without any controversy. We know what's truly best for college football and our wallets. Now let's party. Well, after all the buildup, the time has come. Nebraska and Florida about to take the field at the Fiesta Bowl to decide the national championship. So far, so good. A consensus 1v2 game between Nebraska, who is looking to become back-to-back -back champions, and Florida, looking for their first championship in program history. Had it still been under the old system with tie-ins, Nebraska would have been in the orange and Florida in the Sugar Bowl regardless of their rankings. Shit, this may work well after all. Quarterback Danny Werfel helped lead Florida to an early 10-6 lead over Nebraska in the first quarter, but then Nebraska woke the fuck up. <laughs> This right here is another reason why the 90s Nebraska teams are looked back on so fondly. Not only in Nebraska, but all of college football. Florida was really goddamn good this year, but to get absolutely slaughtered meant only that Nebraska was just playing on God mode. First time we have consensus back-to-back -back champions since the 50s. See? Everything is fine. Relax. We got this. Really, it's not the player's position to question the refs or anything about the types of play. That was always been the coach's position. I worry about what I have to worry about. And the intensity, war, all out. This going to be a chance to go around and wear a ring and brag and say we number one. The national championship means everything. Nothing else is acceptable. Remember when I said shit was fine? It ain't. 1997 completely broke the alliance in multiple ways that could not be fixed. First off, remember when I said that mid-majors were not allowed? BYU from the WAC went 14-1, yet were not allowed to be in the Big Alliance Bowl games. They would play in the Cotton Bowl and win, but the Cotton Bowl was removed from the Alliance when it was reformed after the Southwest Conference died. The fact they couldn't even be in the major Alliance Bowls drew a lot of bad press, and BYU will come back to bite them in the ass later for this. Next, as you can clearly see, we're back to another one versus three in the national championship because number two, Arizona State, was contractually obligated to play number four, Ohio State, in the Rose Bowl. Ohio State would win and finish number two, but had Arizona State won, the national championship could have been split with the winner of the Sugar Bowl. In the immediate aftermath, the Big Ten and Pac-10 finally began to seriously discuss discontinuing the traditional Rose Bowl games as, 
Had it not been for this agreement, Arizona State would have played Florida for the national championship. Oh, and by the way, the third reason shit started to come apart? Florida State got blown the fuck out by Florida in the Sugar Bowl. A very pissed off Gators team had learned their lessons after the ass whooping by Nebraska the year prior and, led by newly crowned Heisman quarterback Danny Werfel, slaughtered the Seminoles. The shit was not working. It's one thing if you have consensus one versus two and one blows out two like last year, but it's another fucking thing when it's one versus three almost every time. There were too many things out of their control and the fact that there wasn't a split champion yet again was just pure dumb luck. It was only a matter of time until it blew up in their faces and just a year later, the clock on that time bomb that has been ticking for the last four years finally went off. To understand the calamity of this year, we need to walk through the season itself. The preseason polls were a sign of things to come, with Penn State and Florida splitting the number one spot with the AP in the college polls. In week four, Washington would jump Florida after beating the shit out of San Diego State, but would proceed to self-destruct against Nebraska the following week. While that was happening, Florida would beat number four Tennessee and leap over Penn State to number one by consensus. Then, week seven, Florida gets upset by number 14 LSU and thrown out of the top five entirely. The next week, Penn State barely beat a dog shit Minnesota team, opening the door for the new number two Nebraska to become number one. A few weeks later, Penn State would be absolutely destroyed by number four Michigan and Nebraska would barely beat an unranked Missouri propelling Michigan to be number one in the country. By the time the regular season was all over, Michigan had beaten number four Ohio State and not only had sealed a Big Ten championship, but were also walking into the Rose Bowl as the consensus number one team in the nation, and there was not a goddamn thing the Alliance could do about it. Instead, the official national championship game had number two Nebraska facing a one loss number three Tennessee and when Michigan winning the Rose Bowl the previous day against Washington State and the team rushing national championship hats onto the field right after it was all but official that the national championship would be at least split as a fitting end to the alliance this was an abomination of a football game Nebraska trounced Tennessee 42 to 17 winning a share of the national championship by the coaches poll while Michigan wins the AP national championship. Frankly, the coaches poll probably just gave it to Nebraska out of pity for the Alliance and also to save face for them. I mean, just imagine the PR after playing a national championship game when the consensus national champion was already crowned on the other side of the damn country. Not taking away anything from Nebraska, they were once again really goddamn good. But this was the final nail in the coffin. There were too many factors that made the alliance awful and now off the field as well with an antitrust lawsuit brewing due to the alliance keeping out all the mid-major conferences. Remember when I said BYU to come back to hurt the alliance? How about team head coach Lavelle Edwards giving testimony to the United States Congress about how the alliance was killing the mid-majors by seriously hampering recruiting efforts by these teams just to compete to the conferences that were not involved in the extremely lucrative alliance and had created an apparent monopoly within FBS itself. And obviously, this was not going to fly as Congress was prepared to pursue legal action. As the old saying goes, money talks, bullshit walks, and the alliance officially disbanded. And so, that brings us to the next and penultimate chapter of this fucking saga, and it's going to be the worst.
As you just saw, this video is going to be going a little bit longer than I thought it was. Originally, I thought it was going to be maybe a 30 to 45 minute max video, hopefully, but nope, there's way too much information in here and I need to more time to cook. So uh, if you want to be notified when the next part comes out, go ahead, subscribe and uh, click the notification icon if you don't mind or don't. I don't really care. It's a small YouTube channel, so we're still trying to grow. I appreciate all of y'all for sticking around to watch and uh, I will catch you on the next upload. Thanks again. Appreciate you all.